Welcome along to the Make It Count podcast. My name is David. My name is Matthew. And we are the Taylor Bros. Coming to you live or not. <laughs> Indeed. And today we are going to do a movie review on Avatar, trying to connect it maybe to Making It Count. And it will include spoilers. I think I'm just going to get that straight up. I don't think I can do a movie review without spoilers. So <laughs> just yeah. in case you haven't seen it, it's been out since six months, seven months. Was it yeah, December, something like. didn't it? December yeah. last year. So that feels like enough time. But if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Yeah. And then listen this to the review. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Matt, Absolutely. First impressions of the film, Avatar 2, The Way of Water. The Way of Water. Very blue. Met much blueness in this film. More blue than the first film? Yes, absolutely. As the, as the title would suggest, there's a lot of water in this one. There was water, of course, in the first one, but this one takes it to a new level. <laughs> sea level. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, in the story, uh, I suppose he, it's... The film has come out, well, the first film came out in 2009, didn't it? This one came yes. out in 2022, so over a decade later. Yep. And kind of, you get the impression maybe 10, 15 years has passed on Pandora, the planet that it's all based on. And yes. so, Sully and, is it Natiri? They're the names, right? Yes, that's a good shout. They they had a family, so there's like four kids on the picture. I promise you, I couldn't name you any of those kids. Um their names did not, yeah, I got lost. I think about an hour into the film, I was like, I don't know who all these people are. But anyway. <laughs> I, I'm still, with you on that one. Yeah, Lots still, of characters. Lots of characters. Yes, exactly. And they're still fighting the humans, right? And then they have a, like, one of their sons nearly has a bad thing happen. So they're like, right, we've got to run away because we've got to protect the family. And so they run to the way of water place where the water tribe people are. They probably yes. have a name. I've yeah. not remembered any of the names from this. I can't remember the tribe names. Yeah, the, he was... Oh, what was the guy... Oh, what was his name? Um, he was the... Oh, this is bad, isn't it? Anyway, they, they've gone from one tribe in the rainforest, effectively, and they've moved to this new tribe, which is effectively like it's sort of Pacific Islanders. That's kind of what's going on here. Yeah. Um, you're, you're moving from rainforest to oceans. And, of course, both of these films have a strong like conservation message or environmental protection message and that just comes all the way through it's so clearly like you've got the humans coming in with their mega sized dump trucks and like bulldozers that are just trashing everything and you know mining or, or like and then this one has a strong sort of whaling element in it so mm -hmm. again that's the that's a large part of the message of the film and that's kind of the down part of the film but it's also like the, the struggle against that yes that's, which is interesting because some of the stuff I was reading about the next Avatar film, um, which maybe we'll come into towards the end of this episode. But yeah, there, there's this, some people talk about it as like complex dualities or maybe it's simple binaries. But on the one hand, you have humans, bad technology, you know, take kill everything and, you know, harvest everything that you can from the planet. And, you know, the the locals the indigenous are are amazing and they live in harmony with their environment and it's all very simple and the way it should be and so you have those sorts of maybe simple binaries but in, in fact it's a, it's maybe more complex than that but yeah that's sort of the humans bad locals good sort of thing yeah and in terms of plot line so again this is some some other reviews i've been listening to as well uh, everybody has kind of said yeah you know, it does feel long. It's a long film. And the it feels like a large part of the first half is just building the scene. It's building the scene out and introducing characters and trying to build these tensions and these character arcs. And when you've got quite a few characters that they want to introduce, you ultimately do need time. I suppose that's what you get from, you know, that was something that they had to do with the Hobbit films that came out because they wanted to really go into depth with all of the different, you know, main characters, they then made three films out of it, whereas really it's a small book. It should have just been done in one, but, you know. So that's kind yes. of... it. It The first half of the film definitely feels slow. Um, yeah, I was 
I, and from a narrative point, well, I mean, someone I read said they they'd sort of speculated they're like this would have been like a really good ninety minute film, maybe a decent two hour film, but three and a three hours and twenty minutes or something. Yeah, yeah it's long. And I suppose I was thinking about it from the narrative point of view, and it feels like it's hitting all the sort of same narrative beats as the first song, uh, first film. So, you know, you have Sully in the first film who has to become, well, he replaces his scientific yes. brother and he has to immerse himself into the tribe and befriend them. And then a bad thing happens. They destroy the tree. Is he good? Is he bad? Okay, let's destroy the humans. And it's sort of like, oh, okay. And then what do we have here? Well, we have the whole family this time displaced and they've got to learn the way of water in the new tribe. And uh, they're, you know, then the whale dies and uh, or is killed. And they're like, oh, that's really bad because this is a super smart, intelligent whale. And that means a lot to us, like the tree did in the previous film. Okay, yeah. let's get them back. And uh, it's like, oh, we've hit the same simple story beats here. Um, yeah. Not that that's bad, but I think a lot of people said, narratively simple, um, but an immersive world. Uh, yeah. And it, the, the world is called Pandora. And it's like, oh, James Cameron kind of like wants us to live there and inhabit it, experience it. And I suppose that was interesting to me uh, because I heard someone recently talk about, uh, they, they were quoting James Cameron. And in the first film, they had this like three minute long flying scene. And generally in storytelling, they're like, either you're moving the plot forward or you're developing the character. And this didn't either, right? This was just three minutes of flying around on these creatures. Yeah. And he was like, but I, I think that's like my favorite scene and I enjoy it. And I think that means audiences will enjoy it. And apparently that was one of the highlight parts of the film. Mm. So just it actually it doesn't move the plot forward and it doesn't move the characters forward, but it's he's creating that space. And I just wondered, well, did that did that work in this second film? Because like there was just a lots of swimming, wasn't there? Oh, lots, <laughs> there, lots of there, was, there was lots. Yeah, in the yeah, <laughs> we haven't done a review of it on the podcast, but when we, for example, watched the uh, the Mandalorian series, uh, one of the common themes comments we always came with. It's just a lot of walking in this. And I think they they were trying to showcase their fancy sort of backdrop screen where it was all around. And so they basically just had the characters walking and changing the background or whatever. Yeah. This one, exactly as you said, it was just a lot of camera angles, on, you know, that's quote unquote, because they're not real cameras, but camera angles in the water, under the water, they're swimming. And, you know, definitely some parts of it, you do, when you kind of snap out and you realise, you know, like, I mean, it's not that disbelief because they're blue people, but you realise, yeah, this is all animation. This is all computer-generated images. Mm -hmm. It is incredible you, the way that they get the the light to to reflect and and you can almost you you can recognise that. Like, yeah, that's how light does build when you've got like a the water surface is all wobbling around and then the light is rippling through. Uh, incredible and the way that they get the fish or even the people to swim around and like the hair in the water floating around it basically go. That is unbelievable, and and from a technical point of view, so I've never seen a animation film just so well done, and it is beautiful. Uh, it is stunning, and in a sense, the way I I treated it was, it's it's effectively an extended art project with a narrative attached. <laughs> you know, that's that's what it is, and you can almost. I wouldn't be surprised if someone wants to try and do this in the future where you've got the ever increasing sort of virtual reality or like augmented reality where people just kind of go, I want to create like a digital world that's like that. And I can just sort of swim around in it or fly around in it. Mm. That might be something that people try and do on the back of some of these films because it is so incredible. Yeah. And and that this whole project is a bit of like James Cameron's dream project, really. And through doing various films, he's allowed himself to do this and he obviously it needs to at least break even and make money and I, I understood that basically the cost of making the film was about 400 million dollars and they already made like 684 million in US box office so that's right. not even like globally so it is set up to make more but this is this is his kind of passion project that and, and we know that because he, didn't they write it like many decades ago? And he basically had to wait until 2009 when the technology caught up with what his vision for what it would look like was. 
And so, you know, even 12 years later, you know, we're getting the second one. And I think the third one is set for release next year. Is it December 24? I think is 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 when it's set to come out. Um, Accelerated timeline. Yes, indeed. But I suppose, again, like you said, it's this immersive world that he's really enjoying. And and actually, it's really nice to have someone that creates these worlds. But I suppose as someone that is, is trying to learn how to tell good stories and is interested in hearing what people have to say about stories, I was like, oh, it's just really kind of predictable or, or simple in a way. You know, yeah. even just as repetitious, like very early in this film, all the children get abducted, right? And then they get rescued. And then they like just later in the film, they all just get abducted again. And then yeah. it's just like, oh, okay, so they're just going to do the same thing. Like nobody learns anything. It's like, okay, cool, you know. And um, and then even like really early on, and maybe this is more of like a, a probably a more intentional choice of like mirroring, and maybe it hones in on maybe what kind of one of the messages of the film is. But the, you know, the whole in like first incident of like why we're going to move is because one of our sons nearly died. Mm. you know he he nearly he gets exploded it's like oh he nearly died and they're like we've got to protect our family we've got to leave and so they leave and they go and then at the end of the film <laughs> the son does die and it's like oh and maybe that's part of one of the messages of like hey you can't run away from some things like you've got to face face these fears and fight and that actually and running away you didn't still protect your son um and so i i think that was and I think James Cameron talked about sort of the, the film being about how far a family will go to protect itself or how far the parents will go to protect the family. And that being maybe a key sort of theme or message of it, which is interesting. Um, yeah, but it, it just felt quite, I mean, so similar that they had the same bad guy, right? And yeah. his motivation seems to be, I'm a army dude that likes blowing stuff up and I want to kill the guy that, killed former me i don't know it's pretty it's weird like, yeah you know, definitely his his motivations are yeah i i wouldn't really? put him up as one of the great bad guys basically it, yeah again this is a master spoiler but he obviously it was uh, colonel i can't remember his name he died at the end of the first film but they had create they'd already like mapped his brain or something and sent it back to earth and they've sent an avatar form of him so like he's now a blue person so is his squaddies and so they now have the the hit squad of um, human blue people who are the bad team, and then you know Sully and and his family uh, are the good ones. So, yeah, and you have that face off. They they definitely. The, it was really interesting because I actually watched it on Father's Day um, with our dad, and the theme of fatherhood comes up more than once because you have obviously Jake as and fatherhood of his family, and it all almost comes up multiple times. It's in in his his like monologues or whatever when he's like narrating it's like mm-hmm. you know a father his role is to protect sort of thing uh and and then you have a, another character we've not spoken about yet but effectively either, there was a baby that was left when all the humans were exiled at the at the end of the first film who was actually it turns out was the son of the colonel uh but he got left because he wasn't you know you can put a baby in i you know cryo or whatever and so he grew up amongst the Natiri and basically was, you know, human, but like wanted to you know, identify with the tribes and wanted to be there. And so then they play off that dynamic with him and his sort of like uh, father's sort of twin or father's clone. Yeah. Uh, and there's a father son thing going on there that is a bit of a complex thing. You can see it really like early on in, oh, they're going to play on that and everything. And it never really felt like it fully developed like it almost never felt like that came to a proper culmination the conflict tension resolution there they just kind of left it hanging probably for the next film yeah. um, because all of those characters survived and so they're trying to build something and they're trying to do this sort of father thing of like you've got the good father and his family and you've got like this other figure who's just the bad guy but also he has a son so like ooh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know I suppose I I wrote a few things as I was thinking back on the film and as I noticed it through the film and I was basically just like, characters, who are they? Like, I think it was only really near the end. I was like, oh, you're that son. Oh, okay. And then he died. Like literally like five minutes later, it was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, right. That's, a, that's how long it took me to work out who he was. Um, <laughs> and, and I suppose, yeah, there was a bit of like, you've got this three hour film 
and yet somehow I don't feel like I know any of the characters apart from the two that made it through from the previous one um and maybe the three and even there like you know you've got Sully the main guy who's a you know the father and he's like peacemaking with everybody else even though his family are causing a ruckus and and things like that but uh yeah that was interesting I suppose the one scene well I should give a disclaimer here and this will make sense I actually watched the film in three separate parts right (laughs) yeah I can believe that yeah so watched the first like hour and was like right time for a sleep um so (laughs) then uh, late I was watching it with my wife and then we we got to the next part and then we had to stop it after the whale scene and obviously this whale scene basically you have this moment where they're trying to kill this super smart intelligent music songwriting whale thing and it's you like you said you talked about this like anti-whaling thing not that that seems to be such a global issue as it maybe has been in the past um but yeah you have this sort of talking about it and you have this one I think maybe they're different it took me ages to figure out which was which as well even out of the humans but the one that was like a hunter like was he South African accent uh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the way the whaler basically. Yeah, the whaler dude, and he was like, "Yeah, you got to shoot him just like this and do this," and it was like that, kind of like clinical in a cruel way. Yeah. Um, and then you have the like the scientist in the hub talking to other people, and it's like, "Yeah, they're they're like really smart, they're really intelligent. They never get like they never fight back." And you have some back scene because they talked about how it's like the way of peace, and they don't fight back because it's better than killing each other or something. Um, but actually, it just it's, it's quite extended like scene when they're just hunting this whale, and not only that, but like it has a, I don't know what a baby whale is called. I suddenly realised uh, probably oh. a calf. I think yeah, so. I think it's a calf, right? I think it's and calf so mammalian. They end up killing the mum and separating the the child from the mum. And yes. in this extended hunt. And actually, you know, my wife found that really quite a, like a cruel thing to watch. And she teared up. And we actually had to stop the film at that point because of just this like blatant cruelty. And and it was like, well, yeah, we see that in the world. Like that, there is cruelty just for what? And what you later realize is, hey, we can harvest this thing from the brain of the whale thing that can mean that humans don't age anymore and it's worth 80 million dollars or whatever yeah and and i suppose that's where the question is it's like well what what would you do for 80 million dollars would you do something and you have this scientist talking about it to like you said the son of the colonel who's been captured at that point and just saying yeah they're very smart you know they write music they're very intelligent arguably more intelligent even than we are whilst the hunt is going on and so you have this like duality of like experience where the hunter's like yeah i get the whale and then you have like the guy going yeah wow we're kind of maybe killing a sentient being here for 80 million dollars but that's funding everything we're doing and it's like well it made me think of that uh henry ford thing uh not a famous quote per se but basically ford were struggling because people had moved from being craftsmen where they'd be a part of like creating the whole process. So you hear this story of someone walking into the shoe shop and everyone would speak to the guy, they'd measure his shoes and then they'd make the shoes and they'd fit them and everything to this moment where you'd be in a factory and you'd do your one bit and you wouldn't see the whole picture. And they said, people were just leaving all the time, just leaving. And they were were worried that they were going to run out of people that could do the work in the factories. And so they doubled the wages and then they had never no strikes after that. And they're like, oh, there's a number at which meaning doesn't matter to you anymore. Wow. <laughs> and it's like, oh, what would what would you do for $80 million in, in you know, that's what it is here, you know? And yeah, so anyway, I just thought it was an interesting, like, oh, maybe that's a little touch on what it might, you know, making it count. What what would you sell out for almost? What, what would you lose your humanity for? Um mm-hmm. I don't know if that's an easy question, but that, is, that was just something that made me think. What did you experience as a, as a, in that scene? Yeah, I suppose I haven't really seen that many film depictions of whaling uh, or any documentary. One, I think the only other one I've seen is Moby Dick. Uh, I one version of that, and I, uh, 
that was also a, a long and hard film to endure. I'm sure the book's great, but that that movie um, incarnation of it was terrible. Uh, um, but yeah, it definitely was filled with emotion. And uh, yeah, it, I suppose, again, going back to it, that's that's part of the, the, the core of what these films are about. And I'm sure that's what the next film, they hinted at, you know, the the, col- the colonel was just a bit part player. He's just a, a warrior. But there was the general on Pandora at that point. And you get this small snapshot of like they're setting up a base, not just for mining operations, but basically a beachhead for we're bringing humanity here because Earth is dying. And of course, that's part of the, you know, that's part of the message. Ultimately, it's like, you know, and it, it's interesting. You've got people like, you know, Elon Musk looking at Mars and you've got people constantly looking out for these exoplanets i think they call them which are like earth-like we could potentially settle there if we needed to you know and i suppose this is the picture of what would happen if we create we found this other planet and there was an indigenous species and we just brought our mess with us uh, and then that's an interesting concept and i suppose it's a bit like going this is what colonizers did you know, mm-hmm. they found a brand new continent and then they just took over and wiped out the indigenous and massively transformed the landscape to suit. And and so, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's an interesting question. What is your price? And I think lots of us would like to say, oh, no, my values and my morals and my, you know, my worldview, I don't have a price. But I suppose you don't have to look at that many examples of people who ultimately we would say have sold out at some point and it wasn't necessarily a one day someone came along and slapped a massive check in front of them and said if you sell out all your values i'll give you this it's more like a little bit here a little bit there we do things by edging you know and pushing the boundaries a little bit and go oh well that's not that different and well that's not that bad and oh well people will understand and i you know i've got to feed my family security this and so that's again part of the question of monetary wealth is that the only wealth and of course the answer this film is trying to say is well no that's not the only wealth family and community but also harmony with the environment or the ecology or you know and of course it goes to you know say there's this the the planet itself has this sort of neural network or something which akin to a a mind or a spirit which is interesting in and of itself yeah So, so yeah so i suppose and i think that that climate sort of perspective of of nature and how we, we you know climate change and all that is very prevalent here i think james cameron obviously filmed the titanic uh he was involved in that film um the making of i did he direct it or i think he directed that didn't he fascinating but know. one of the one of the quotes i saw in reading the reviews for avatar 2 is this idea that you know the captain of the titanic went down with a pocket full of telegrams saying there's ice ahead and they ignored it because they thought they could and he basically went we're in the 90 seconds before we hit the ice now you know from a climate perspective that's sort of what he's saying he said we're living in that 90 seconds and what are we going to do are we going to plow on ahead are we going to hit the ice or we not and so that was just interesting so that's why it's quite a strong uh message in it uh, with but also, I suppose the the make it count bit to me is looking at James Cameron, right? Because he basically went, I love the ocean. When I'm not at the ocean, like when I'm not filming, I'm at the ocean, you know, and I go there and I love it. And, you know, he's done the Titanic film and now he's made The Way of Water. And actually he's bringing two of his passions, filmmaking and, uh, and, and the ocean together. And he's sort of able to bring those things together really well such that i mean you said it was all animation but the actors the producers they all got scuba qualifications to do it right so as i was reading about this as i all getting qualified to do this and and actually um you know from a film perspective i understand they've already got all the all the shots in the can whatever he meant by that for the third film right so it's already done and they've already got some stuff for like the fourth film so it's like Oh, interesting. But it was just interesting. He loves the water. He would be there anyway. And he's managed to bring that together as a passion. And I suppose sometimes it's easy to lose that in the day to day. We we don't get enthusiastic or passionate about things. I mean, sometimes in the UK, we we sort of well, a bit of a snide look at people. We look down on passion a little bit. Enthusiastic or passionate about something or mm. a bit cynical of them. But actually 
he's gone for it and you know yeah. for for all the criticism he's he's getting to do things that he loves to do and make things that he wants to to do and yeah. you know that's, that's really yeah so go yeah that, actually that's a good point i think that what they do with the filming is they it's like they dress them up in those fancy suits like Gollum had uh, but obviously these ones they're in the water and they're swimming around so yeah so there's obviously camera work involved i suppose you could say avatar pandora is a passion project and what we're seeing is the passion project over decades of of someone spearheading it dreaming it up and, and pushing it and p- perfecting it but also whole you know hundreds probably thousands of other people have contributed to this it's enjoyable to watch overall don't expect too much of the storyline i think the best way to watch it generally is building your own interval you know building your own intermission <laughs> at about the halfway mark go and have dinner come back and watch the other half of it after you sort of you know because then it gets a little bit more action and stuff happens but enjoy the actual the view that the the stunning array and if obviously you've got a nice home cinema set up great if not you'll just have to make do with whatever you've got yeah brilliant well that was the uh the film review avatar way of water um 2022 we hope you enjoyed that. We'd love to hear your opinions on the film. I'm sure if you've watched it, you have opinions. Everyone has opinions on films. Yeah. So uh, let us know. I uh, hope that helps you in some way, maybe make it count or inspires you to keep going in your passion pursuits. Absolutely. Let us know if there are any other films you want us to review. Taking requests. Coming up next over the summer is our summer short series, I believe. So that's starting next week. And that will be kept a little bit of a secret until then. <laughs>